So tonight, I wanted to talk about uh, research. And it seems like a really basic topic, but um, I think I have some insights to help people in their, in their search for truth. Or maybe not, maybe everything I, I know other people are already doing. But uh, at the very least, I thought I'd try to share some of my ideas for truth seeking, and maybe it'll help some people in their walks. I, 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 oh yeah. Always tell baby to shut up before start lesson. You can't be teaching anything with baby crying and yelling and all these kids screaming every place. So, uh, first of all, uh, you have to do time management. You have to determine how much time you have available to do your truth seeking. And then when you start researching, like for example, let's say you go on Google and you do a, a Google search. There might be millions of hits. Well, obviously you don't have enough time to, to go through all those hits. So you either have to only do a little bit, a few of those, or you want to narrow down your search results. And Go Google, I find, is one of the best resources available for us of uh, free, free resource. Because, you know, you, there's many other resources to use, but which require a lot more uh, involvement from your own resources, be it financial or a large amount of your time. So for those who don't have as much time and as much financial ability to do certain things, Google is a pretty good resource to use. But basically, there are some things that that are pretty simple for Google, but a lot of people are not familiar with them. So I'll try to draw on the board. Uh, maybe I don't even have to draw on the board, but I'll just do it just because. Basically, when you're doing a Google search, like let, let's think of a topic here. I, I was thinking of, uh, even though Ty's not in the room, um, the whole thing with the virgin birth and the and when day begins, stuff like that. You know, so let's say you wanted to research the virgin birth. So you. You enter into Google Virgin Birth. So what happens when you when you enter this? You Google recognizes this as two separate terms. So it's going to show you pages which are linked to Virgin only, which might be something completely you know it might be talking about have I lost my virginity or you know that type of thing. Birth, which could talk about anything that has to do with birth. It would also include Virgin Birth, but it could be you could go through a thousand articles before you find something about Virgin Birth. So one way to narrow it down is to do quotation mark. I'm sure so at least most of you guys probably know the quotation mark way of doing it. It narrows it down for specifically to just this phrase. So it only returns websites which have as a, a link linked tags virgin birth. But still doing that there's just so much out there about the virgin birth. You're going to get a lot of stuff from various Christian websites. And let's say you're a Torah keeper and you don't want all that stuff. So you could, you, one of the great tools is using the minus mark. That's one of my favorite ones. Because basically, you can say, for example, uh, you could say, um, let's say, you can, you can say Catholic and you don't want any websites that have Catholic in it. That's like, and that you're saying that's a minus. Yes, a minus sign. Okay. So when you do the minus sign and whatever word follows, you don't want to see anything about that has to do with Catholic. And then you might, you might do something else, a so virgin birth, and then you might do Torah. Now it's going to return results virgin birth and <coughs> Torah in it. So you're narrowing down your results when you do this approach. Now let's say you wanted to read something by the Ligos. Well, it would take a very long time to find something probably from the Ligos unless they got lucky and it's one of the first results. So you might do their last name. Names are key. Names are key to finding things. If you know someone's name of an important individual or scholar, you want to include the name because it's going to really help narrow down the resources you're looking for. But if I, I'm like, oh, I don't want to read those guys' stuff. I, I hate their stuff. Well then, minus Weigel. So anything that they've done that's marked with their name, I'm removing from the, from the equation. So these, these are really good uh, ways of narrowing down your results. Then you also have, uh, for you go to Google for advanced search, and you have all kinds of things for advanced search. You can search specific websites. So you can say, I only want results from Carrie's website. Or you can say, I only want results from the Catholic website. So maybe you do want Catholics, Catholic things. Or maybe, maybe you're interested in some of the Apocrypha stuff. So you might, you might say virgin birth and then Apocrypha. So it's going to narrow down the results to <coughs> Apocrypha text, which reference the virgin birth. So things like this will really, you know, you don't have to do a plus when you're doing the Google search. You just 
if, if you don't have quotes, and you don't need quotes around single words, single, it's unnecessary. Um, but when you have two words and you want it to be a single phrase, you need to put quotes around the entire phrase. Um, then I forget exactly how, like the exact typing thing, but one of the things you can do, it's not exactly like this, but it's something like this. You could do something like, um, let's see, uh, you could do, um, let me think here, uh, I'm trying to think of a good word. Okay, you could do maybe something like this. So right here, basically what would happen is it would return, I don't know if it's an asterisk or if it's something else, but some type of symbol you put here, basically it will return results. It has to have this letter, this letter, and this letter, but it could have, uh, it could be bear, or it could be bore, or something like that, where basically that letter is a free-for-all. It could be any letter. Wow. Wow. Yes. So these are various <laughs> ways to help really narrow down what you're looking for. Then, I mean, this is of course all just free Google stuff. Got, uh, one extra one on. What do you use? <coughs> you uh, started out by. Yeah, you can do the, the site. I use that all the time. The site colon, what is site colon? Site colon URL. Yeah, you can do that, but you you can also, if you don't remember how to do that, you can go to advanced search settings and it'll say search by site and you type in the site and it'll do the same thing automatically. Um, so it, this, this is just a, a way of using Google, but the thing is, these are, these are various tools and methods to find the information, but you need to be smart and you need to use your own reasoning abilities. And you, you have to really think about how, again, how much time do you have to research some of these things? And if there's like millions of results, you just simply don't have time to go through all that stuff. So you really want to narrow it down to something that you can do in your time abilities. So you want to think of words and terms which really narrow down the topic of what you're really trying to focus on. That's all right. Um, so just using your brain for, like, for example, rare words, words that are not commonly used, which are maybe perhaps academic or scholarly words, or let's say you remember so you remember reading something, and you're like, oh, what was that book? What was that book? I just can't remember the book. But if you remember something about the content, then you ha then you got to try to think of various words which are likely to bring you to that website or that source again. So you have to really sometimes, uh, it's like a puzzle sometimes, trying to find the missing piece. And it, uh, it takes a lot of time and uh, practice to really get good at research. And one of the most important things is motivation. You, if you really, really, really want to know something or find something out, you're going to be so motivated to do it that you won't stop until you find it. And that's one of the most important things of finding information is you have to have your heart in it and you have to really uh invest in it. and when you do that then you can really find like tons of information that most people <laughs> won't find because you're taking the time to wade through all the results that are coming through have you seen carrie have you seen some, some of these before for this is google we're going through the google thing okay. quotations oh yeah the the uh wild card. the wild card oh, no, I like so basically if you do this oh, it, yeah. it'll give you results like bear and okay, boar gotcha. um and then i also showed them the minus one you know the minus one uh, where, like, like I, I, I used you guys earlier as an example. If I didn't want stuff from your guys' site, I could say minus LIGO, and any sites that have that term in it, okay. it would cut out of results. So that's really helpful for narrow, really narrowing down. So, I won't go into too much detail on this, but, you know, if you're trying to find information about people, you want to learn about different people, then you can search their name. So, for example, if I want to, if I want to learn something about Matthew Parrott, you can't just say Matthew because it's 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 too broad. It's too broad. So um, so you know you probably do the last name Matthew Parrot. Two T's, right? Maybe you misspell it, and that wouldn't be good. But uh, sometimes when you misspell it, they include other spellings in your results. But basically, this is not really the best to find the information you're looking for because it's going to give you results for Matthew. And it's going to give you results for Parrot. And then somewhere in the huge results of it will be met stuff perhaps about Matthew Perry. Oh, no, I'm all on the first page. Yeah, he's all on the first page because of his uh, day study. That's that's his claim for fame. <laughs> yeah. So you can put you can put a quotation mark, and that will help narrow it down. But there might be other people with your name. <laughs> yes, two to twenty-seven. So. Uh, it would help if you know something more about the person. So if this is a complete stranger, then I'm probably not going to know too much more about it. But maybe I know his birth date, so I can enter the birth date. Or maybe I know places you've lived or activities you've done. Or maybe you know the store she works at. Or maybe you know the store she works at. Or I like to Or, you know. <laughs> so you just narrow it down like that. Um, but let's say you don't... Like, and then the minus, the minus helps because 
if you don't know certain terms, like if you don't know too much about, uh, if you don't know too much about the person, you might know certain things that, oh, well, that's definitely not about that for him. So you could do, uh, yeah, or, so things like that. Um, you might even be able, I, oh yeah, you can also do uh, results in only a certain language. Uh, you can, I think you might, I'm not sure if you're able to do this, but you might be able to do results only from a specific region of the world, <coughs> like US sites or something like that. Anyway, so uh, the more information you want to find out about someone, the, the more uh, passionate about it, the more likely you're going to find something because the more you won't give up until you find the information. And I found a lot of information about just random people. Uh, I'll tell a little story. There was this, there was this one, uh, I, I went to this uh, dating website, it's okay. Cupid, and uh, there was this uh, like it, it gives you a, like match matches like uh, how much based on their questions they answered that they match with you and how much they're your enemy based on their answers compared to yours. So there was this one uh, picture of of a woman, and I was like, oh, she she looks attractive. Um, she was actually going by a uh, a different name, like that wasn't her real name on the site. But so basically, I was able to uh, figure out what her real name was just by using her picture. Um, and eventually, I was able to find her Facebook uh, Facebook page, and I messaged her, and then she was like freaked out and she blocked me or whatever. So. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyways, you're, so you're a stalker. So <laughs> because she wouldn't reply on the site. So <laughs> I know I'm okay. I'm okay with it. On the recorder, but so <laughs> basically, how I was able to find out was because, uh, uh, well, you can also do on Google, you can do search by image. So, um, uh, I searched the picture and it brought me to uh, it brought me to um, a picture from a college uh, graduation photo or something like that, or not college, a uh, high school graduation photo. So, then I was also doing research to see uh, what relatives she had to make sure because I didn't want to message someone on Facebook that wasn't actually the person. I wanted to make sure, okay, this definitely is the right person before I message. So, I want I did all this research trying to figure out, okay, all right, now I know this definitely is the person. So, <laughs> it depends how you define it. <laughs> so, let me tell you one other thing. What's the subject of this? This is how to research. Yeah. <laughs> Not how to stalk. <laughs> but stalking is a form of research. <laughs> But not necessarily condoned. But you know. so there's one other example. I'm not gonna give again. Not gonna give too much detail. But basically, uh, there was uh, this person that you've heard me talk about before. Uh, that it turned up on everybody's on that. Yes, everyone's enemy. <laughs> and uh, basically, um, she, she didn't want me to know uh, the, who she was in a relationship with. So when she put uh, when she put um, that she's in a relationship on her Facebook, you know, you can you can do it where you tag the person like in a relationship with, or you can just say in a relationship, but you don't say who it is. So that's what they did. And then like within a day, I messaged the guy that she's in a relationship with. And I'm like, I don't know. anyways, so they're they're thinking like. How did he find out? I don't know. <laughs> How could he do this? Well, it was actually really simple. Basically, I just looked. You see, I'm just you. Just you. You try to use thinking outside the box, but it's really simple stuff sometimes that people often overlook. And so you think. Um, you look. I, what I did was I looked and see. Okay, who liked the post? And then I went to each person's page. It was like, okay, is this person in a relationship? Blah blah blah. And, and then I found the one person's profile, and I went to their profile, and and the, and they had a status saying in a relationship. And I said, but it's a secret. I'm not saying who it is. And then the the person that I was interested in, she was li she liked some of the comments or whatever. But so basically, you're using process of elimination, that type of thing. I'm using my own personal experiences just to illustrate how you can do this. I'm not saying you should image what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm learning from my mistakes. I've done it too. You can really track about it. I say, don't do yes, that. yes. Just to let everybody know, you won't be at next year's coat. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're not you didn't accept it. Yeah. I sent you a friend request, you didn't accept it. I wonder why. He's probably got, I mean, he's got how many? Four profiles? Uh, maybe like 14. Wow. I'm friends with at least three profiles. I knew there was at least that many. Well, anyway, I won't go into too much of that detail. But anyway, so you should go again to like it. Uh, a private investigator will find. Yeah, we could do well with that. I probably could if I had the resources. But anyway, I just bring up these examples just to kind of illustrate. You really can find things about if, about something you really want. You're really passionate about if you put in the time and research the the efforts to to do it. So. 
let's see what else was I going to talk about? Um, oh, uh, bibliographies are also very important for my research because I've one of the things I'm obsessed about is the apocrypha, like what book should be part of the Bible. And I've researched that probably more than any other topic. And I want to see every single book possibly that's out there, and not just apocrypha, but other books. Uh, I want to read as many books as possible. So um, I. One of the keys is buying, if, if you are able to buy things, that's important because there's some information that you can only access through purchases. And so when you buy, like, let's say, books of the Apocrypha, at the, in the appendix, they will often give a list of, these are other books that are good to look at. So you, you, you do that, and you say, okay, I'll look at these books. And you get those books, and they have their... They have their recommendations, and then those books have those recommendations. So when you go through that process, and you really want to focus on a certain topic that's really of interest to you, you just keep narrowing it down by looking at the bibliographies. And and a lot of those, some of those resources are freely available online because they're in the public domain, and they've been scanned and uploaded to Google Books, Archive.org, and so there's just so much information online. We can really like be able to teach ourselves if we have the time and patience to do it. And uh, um, you think, but the problem is when you're researching and trying to learn things, uh, you could easily be led astray because you know that some there's a saying that some people say, uh, like if, I don't know the exact way they put it, but if someone teaches themselves, then like you're only as good as your teacher, and if you're if you don't know anything, then how can you teach yourself? So there's a huge danger of like you know the Messiah said a blind leading the blind. Well, if you're blind and trying to teach yourself, that's a problem. So. Uh, the key, from what I have seen, is we ta I talked about it with Matthew a little bit before. Is uh, trying to figure out certain things which you know without a shadow of a doubt have to be, have to be true. Those are your foundations, your things that are non-negotiables. Then, when you go to those foundation topics, then you can say, okay, well, if these things are true, what else must be true if these things are true? If you can use that approach, then you can say, okay, these topics must be true if this is true. Then you have a broader foundation. You could easily overstep your reasoning abilities and you could think that this has to be true, but you might have reasoned wrong or incorrectly. So you have to be really careful, you have to be really diligent in your reasoning of this topic of, is this really necessarily has to be true if your foundation is true? But, so to give an example, is there no God or you know, is there a creator? If there is a creator, if we can prove or if we can know for ourselves without a shadow of a doubt that there has to be a creator, then that's going to necessarily lead to other conclusions. But we want to be careful what do those other conclusions lead to. For example, um, if there's a creator, uh, does it lead necessarily to the conclusion that there's no free will or that there's predestination? Maybe, maybe not. We don't want to. Make, we want to be careful in making the jumps. We don't want to make a jump in your reasoning. But you want to start with what is certain. Are you going to going to bed, Mary? Is she going to bed? Oh, uh, I, w I was going to say if she was, I was going to say goodnight. Well, I'll still be friends with some of my other profiles. But... <laughs> no, I know. You can't get rid of all the profiles. You don't know all. Yes. Well, I want to get. I want to. I'm going to actually tell. A little bit more of a story about the uh, alternate profile thing. I did, I pretended in 2012, in the fall of 2012, for about a week, I pretended to be an anti Paul person. Like, oh, Paul's evil, he's a horrible person. I was trying to, like, make a believable persona or whatever. And for, like, about a week, I convinced these people that I was anti Paul. It was all in an attempt to befriend a certain person that I had a falling out with, but it didn't work. So then I decided to tell the people, I was like, this is what I did, uh, just to let you know. And then a year later, I wasn't pretending to be an anti-Paul person, and I was trying to use, like, different language, but these people who, like, I hardly knew at all, like, I didn't even know some of these people, and they're like, somehow they knew it was me based on the style of my language and words that I was using. Like, I, was, I had a very unique uh, signature in the language that I use that people could see, this, this guy really sounds like that that crazy guy from last year or something. So you can actually, uh, it's amazing what you can find out just by using your reasoning abilities. Like these people were able to, to see that who I was based on my style. And we, we kind of do similar reasoning, like who was the author of Hebrews? People say it was Paul, but when we're looking at the style of uh, the writers, Paul's style doesn't really seem to match at all the style of the writer of Hebrews. So that's a good indication to us. There's many other reasons, but that's one of the indications that Paul probably did not write that letter because it doesn't match. Um, and I was saying something earlier, but I forgot what I was saying. Um, who do I think wrote Hebrews? Uh, I believe it was Barnabas, but I don't have a way to prove it. Um, it was definitely some big 
I didn't want to say about what Jackson said. I, if I remember correctly, it doesn't say that the Torah is obsolete. It says that the Old Covenant is obsolete. Is it the Law of Moses? Is it the Law of Moses, would you say? But, so, the question is, for example, uh, was there no Torah before the Old Testament was written? Or was there a Torah, and if there was a Torah, then it's not necessarily the same as the Old Covenant. Um, no, you know, you're fine. I think it's a good aside that we talked about. Um, Carrie reminded me of what I was trying, like, my train of thought, and that was jumping and making conclusions without necessarily having proof. So, like, for example, you know, Matthew was saying he thinks it's a woman. It's fine to make those type of conclusions as a possibility or saying this very likely could be. But if he then goes to say this is what it is, and then he makes it, and then he uses that to say, well, because because a woman wrote it, therefore this. See, he's making leaps. You're 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 using it as if it was proven fact to conclude other facts, and you can't do that. You can only do that if you are absolutely certain that what that fact or what that uh, idea was is true. So you really want to focus on the things that you can know for absolutely certain, and then what can you branch off from that that you can be pretty certain about. And the more you do that, the, be the, the greater security you're going to have. And I have this belief that the scriptures uh, have an overall picture. So imagine like a puzzle piece or a painting or something. And you take a painting and you take all, split it into lots of different pieces. Now, if you start, you can say each, you, you could maybe say each book is a separate piece of the puzzle, each book of scriptures. So if you're putting the pieces together, overall, you're going to see an image. Let's say you see a picture of a lion or a tree or something. Uh, let me think, should be lion or tree? Uh, let's say lion. So um, let's say you have like a really, something really close to a picture of what a lion's supposed to be, but let's say on the side of its, or let's say on the left, or the, the left side of the lion, there's like, instead of the rest of the lion's face, there's like uh, the head of a giraffe or something. Um, it's like, okay, well, that's that's not part of the picture. That That's something contrary to what it's supposed to be. But you're looking at the entire image and you can easily see, okay, that doesn't fit. But you're, it's not like you're, it's not like you're, um, it's not like something that's, how do we know? How do we know? But you you can know because you have the overall image, so you can easily see things that are out of place. This only works if most of the image is accurate and authentic or preserved well. If all the pieces are distorted and horribly and not really reliable at all, then maybe it was originally a lion, but now it looks like a goop. You don't even know what it is. Madam Library. <laughs> As long as most of the pieces are close to the original, some of the pieces could be off, but you can look at the overall image and you can you can use the reasoning of okay, this must have been uh, this must be corrupted from the original image. So you can use things like that. Um, you uh, and I think if we real you know at, at school at high school we, we learned uh, epistemology. Have any of you guys taken that kind of class or philosophy classes in college or anything like that? Uh, basically they teach you different reasoning skills and logical laws and there's certain logical laws which are the foundation of everything and you can if you really take your time to learn how logic works you begin to see flaws in people's reasoning. You can see wait a minute they're making a appeal to this or and when you start seeing these things, you can realize that some of the conclusions we're making are just, they don't make sense, the, the, the reasoning we're using. And there's this, there's this thing in, um, in logical reasoning as well that the conclusion could be true, but how you concluded it could be completely ridiculous. So you also want to be careful that just because you use bad reasoning doesn't necessarily mean the conclusion is wrong. Um, so you want to really be careful of... Uh, of how you are coming to your conclusions because it's so easy to it's very easy to overlook something which is a flaw in our reason uh, because sometimes there are really minor details which are showing that we're contradicting ourselves and we don't even realize it it's these type of things we really want to focus on is our argument consistent does it make sense is it plausible um yeah is it based on assumption uh so all these things so i also think a lot of our beliefs are based on our own language but the problem is we're here's i used to believe this when i was a kid here's what i used to believe i used to think that english was the language the main language and all other languages was like i was like why do they 
why don't they speak English? Like, I, I, I really felt that English was like the, the primary language of everything and that anyone who spoke any other language was like going away from the, the language of nature. But I was really young when I was thinking that. It was because it's because what I was used to, or what I was raised up to, to in, in my culture, I was applying it universally. And we have to be careful of that jump because the way we think in English is not necessarily the same way people think in other languages because their, their words have different meanings. Um, it, logic is the same in all languages, but the words we're using are not the same. And even within the same English language, there are some major differences. Not only, um, in, there's different dialects of English. So if you go to British uh, English, some words we use have a completely different meaning in England and vice versa. Other times, um, it might be within the same dialect, but the people who are using it are using it incorrectly. They're using it based on how they heard other people using it, and those people might have been using the words wrongly. So when you're having a conversation with someone, and they're saying a word, they're going to use the word how they understand it based on their own experience, and not necessarily the correct way it actually means. So that can sometimes create conflicts in communication with other people, and reasoning ability. <laughs> when, we're, when we're reading the scriptures, we are often imposing our own language into other people's words. But maybe our understanding of language differed from the, the people who wrote these books. So I think it's a good idea to study language too and to try to understand other people's perspective. When we start thinking outside the box and thinking outside of ourselves and trying to put ourselves in other people's shoes, then we better emphasize with other people and we can better understand other people's perspectives. And then we can say, well, you know, maybe I see what, I see what that person's saying. You know, that, may, that makes sense what they're saying. Uh, that type of thing. You want to really do that type of stuff. Um, and I like to collect things for my research. So I, I, I'm sure I've mentioned it to you guys before, uh, like for example, the Dead Sea Scroll resources. I found a bunch of the, uh, from my friend, he sent me uh, a PDF of all the Dead Sea Scroll uh, critical edition, which is a really valuable resource. It's an exhaustive thing by the scholars. And you'll see that for a lot of other writings. And um, that when, you, when you're searching for information, it's going to be as good as the databases you're using are. So Google, that database, is as good as that database is. Um, and diff different databases out there. Uh, there. There's also, before the internet, we had databases. It was just a different kind of database. The library, that's a database. It's the physical. You have to actually go to a library and look up the books. You look at the catalog, and it takes so much more time and money. And, you know, uh, go back 500 years ago, uh, the fact is we would probably not be able to do most of what we've done in our in our research and truth seeking because we would have had to go spend lots of money and travel very far to read some of the books that we've read um so in many ways the internet is a great blessing uh, but the internet is not putting something new to us in the sense that what the internet provides for us is just an amplification of what could already be done it just took so much longer to do so uh, these ideas have always been there. Uh, it's just you know, time management and financial management. So if you were really devoted, you would go to different libraries and look up different information. And there's some information that you can only find in certain libraries. Like there's the Secret Archives of the Vatican. Uh, that was about 200 years ago, roughly. That actually was open to the public. So now it's no longer closed. And it used to be that no one could access it except the, uh, the officials. But they decided to open it to scholars, not just regular people like you and me. You have to be part of the institution, but they're actually opening it to scholars. Uh, they have to go through a lengthy process to do it, but they are able to do it, and they're able to see whatever writing they want in there. They just can't take that writing and publish it uh, without permission. Um, so uh, there's so much information in the Vatican that we don't, we can't access on the internet. We'd actually have to physically go to that library to to look it up. And there's a lot of things like that where some information is simply not online. So it depends how deep you want to go into research. How much do you really want to find out about the topic you're researching? You could go really intense, but how intense you might want to go might require you to spend a lot of time and money uh, on what you're doing. So I have a goal in life. Uh, like, I think reading is extremely important. And because, it, think about it, if, if, if we, you know, I, we, we've tried to come to the Torah uh, and try to return to the ancient ways. Did we do that by only reading uh, writings by evangelical Christians? No, we, we, well, first of all, we started reading the Bible more for ourselves, but I'm sure pretty much all of us read articles by Torah keepers who are already Torah keepers. And when we, when we read these things, we're, look, we're going outside the box. We're looking at other people's perspective. And that's exactly what we need to do, we need to do I believe. I think we need to, we need to look 
not just at our own group's ideas, but let's look at what other people are saying. And there's two reasons for this. One is maybe they're right about some things. And secondly, even if they're not right about these things, if we can understand them better, perhaps we can better explain to the other people why those ideas are wrong. But how can we do that if we don't sufficiently understand what their ideas are? So um, I want to, like, for example, I have, I have a library website online. Uh, I spent many, many hours trying to gather PDFs, and then I, it was a very long task, and I could have done a lot more, but I just took a break. Basically, what I did was I, there, there's these groups that, um, they have a mission, and one of their, like, so there's a, for the Greek literature, and there's this mission of these scholars, and they want to publish, or they, they want to get into a database all Greek writings that have been written since ancient times up until the modern day. And they're working on this actively, and they've been working on it for many decades. And they have a list of each major author that we that we know of of Greek writers. So I went to this list and looked at all the Greek authors on the list, and I started trying to look up as many of these PDFs as possible, and then putting them on my website. A lot of the PDFs, a lot of these writings have not been translated into English yet, but many of them have, and many of them are in the public domain. So I would get PDFs and put them on my website, and I have like over 500 PDFs of various writings. Uh, but so the idea is, if we're just looking at our own people's ideas, then um, how will we ever know if we're wrong about something? Uh, we, we could be wrong about some major things and we'll never know it because we're not taking uh, initiative to open our mind to other people. So I, I say this with a disclaimer. I don't think everyone should be doing this uh, unless they have certain groundings. You need to have a reliable foundation. If you don't have a reliable foundation, then you're going to go every which way, and that's not healthy either. You want to have certain things that you know for certain, and then once you have that foundation that you can stand on, then start doing some of this research into other people's viewpoints. So I think reading uh, what the Muslims have to say, what Hindus, what even pagans might have to say, uh, can be a val valuable uh, thing to do. But again, not everyone has all the time in the world to do these things. So time management, most people have lots of responsibilities and families, so they can't read every writing in the world. So you have to pick and choose which writings you're going to read. And what you want to do, I believe, you should pick writings which are very influential in the world. Examples would be Plato, the writings of Plato. That's highly influential. One of the most influential writings in the world. So that would be something I think would be a good idea to read, if not only for just the fact of how much it has influenced society. So many ideas of Plato are things we actually, all of us probably believe some things that because Plato taught them. So it would be a good idea to see if we're trying to, if we're trying to rid ourselves of paganism or foreign ideas, well, maybe we should be looking at what some of the origin of some of these ideas are. Um, or we might start looking and saying, you know what? Some people have been saying these ideas are pagan, but maybe they're not. Maybe because sometimes what these other groups are saying line up with the scriptures. So it helps to see that because it, you start to realize that, um, like Carrie, you talked about the other day, how like it doesn't make sense the idea that you know salvation only for Israel and every other nation that's ever existed pretty much doomed and damned because they weren't born an Israelite. That doesn't really make sense. That's not what a just creator would do. Uh, he's going to be fair and just, and he's going to judge everybody based on what they were able to do, what they were able to know. And so, uh, but, so when we see that all these other groups, all these other cultures and religions, although they have major differences and some really bad theology, they also have a lot of truth that, that we share together. And what we see is that there's actually kernels of truth in every place so that no one's without excuse. There's always light everywhere in these places that if they simply follow that light, they will be led to the truth if they're diligent in their seeking for the truth. And so, like, for example, in most cultures and religions, there's this idea of do unto others as you would have them do unto you and uh, love your neighbor as yourself. This is a foundational thing. And so many cultures also have this idea of uh, denial of yourself. Which basically, um, don't live for yourself, live for other people. There's just so many things we can learn and see that uh, the picture is much greater than what we might think it is. Uh, and people who we associate as, oh, those people are completely different than me, they have nothing in common with me, they might actually have a lot more in common with you than you might realize. If you take the time to hear what they have to say, what they have to say and learn their perspective. But, you know, Robert, been, uh, you, you've mentioned uh, certain things of the Bible you've, uh, you've been questioning and things like that. And uh, I think we have to be careful of, again, jumping to conclusions on, on certain things. But we also do need to be open-minded to the possibility. Again, I don't, I don't believe the Bible is not reliable or that it's false, but that 
uh, if we expect other people, like if we expect Muslims, Buddhists, pagans, if we expect them to be open-minded to what we have to say, how then can we be closed-minded to what they have to say? Because otherwise, we're basically giving them a message of, you have to listen to what I'm saying, but I don't have to listen to what you're saying. And that doesn't seem to really be fair, and they're probably thinking the same thing about us. They might be thinking, well, you need to listen to what I'm saying, but I'm not going to listen. You know, I'm not going to listen to what that guy's saying, because I know I have the truth. That's what all these other people, everyone thinks they have the truth, except for a, a they or people who are undecided they, they don't know they're, they're honest enough to say oh, I'm confused I don't know I have no clue about this stuff but anyone who comes to a conclusion about their beliefs they're gonna believe that they're right and that other people are wrong so that's the reality and to be fair and consistent and to really seek truth I think we need to be open with other people and say I'm I'm open to what you have to say but I, I have a firm foundation so I'm not gonna just change my beliefs willy-nilly but if you can make a really compelling case then I'll <coughs> then I'll con consider what you're saying and maybe I'll change if you can prove it so I think if we approach like that then we may very well find the, the truth we're all looking for for. But if we just stay within our box and say, no, that could never be, and, and I'm not going to consider what they're saying, then we may never find the truth because we will never know that we never had it to begin with. Um, we can say that there's something very similar that goes on with mainstream Christianity, <laughs> is that they have, they have their agenda, and they're not, well, many of them are not open to what we have to say. But I don't think, I think we have to be careful of applying across the board certain, you uh, um, universal strokes saying you know all muslims are this way or all no. christians are this way no i'm not saying let them into your home because the fact the fact is well they're going to come to our country no matter what there there we have we have uh, many many muslims already living here and, and we many people will interact with them uh if they if they're part of the world if they have a job regular job things like that um, they're going to be interacting with these people. And we are called to preach the gospel to other people. Um, you, if you read some of the Apocrypha Acts of the various apostles, you know, these people went to, they preached to some people who were worse than some of these Muslim people in some ways. Like they were, they, they went to cannibalist tribes and were trying to bring them to the light. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that. We can't expect to change an entire an entire group, but what we can we can have two goals. One goal is to change ourselves, and the other goal is to try to change other individuals to the best of our abilities. We can't we can't change a whole nation, but we can we can approach people because people are they're just like you and me. They they have hearts, they have uh, things they're going through, and I think they have a lot more in common sometimes with us than we might suspect. And if you approach them on a more relationship level and you uh, talk about the things you have in common with them and then challenge them in a way that you're not, you're not being threatening to them, if, if they feel like you're not trying to hurt them or attack them, but if you're trying to just uh, be real with each other and, and try to help each other, and, and if, if they know that you're being open-minded to what they have to say, they're not going to feel like you're just trying to convert them to everything. That you're, you're, if you're talking with them and, and you're saying, this is what I believe, and I'm just wondering what you believe, why do you believe that? Well, it says, in, it says in Scripture, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall what, inherit the earth or something like that. Um, the thing is, peacemakers is implying that their people are at odds with each other at war. And I would think, uh, if these people are, are trying to rape and, and kill people, if we can change them, if we can, or at the very least, if we can put a stop to them and, and make them stop doing this, either by dialogue or by fo legal force, if we can, or, you know, if sometimes physical force, go to war with them, or we have to put a stop to them at somehow. One of the ways of doing that is dialogue. Like in the um, writings of Clement that Jackson has talked about, Peter basically says, you know, how his opponent, Simon, references how Messiah said, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And then Peter basically tries to explain that the Messiah was not saying that that uh, that we shouldn't try to make peace with people. He, he, he's saying that uh, because the righteous stand for righteousness, the enemy is going to be hostile towards us and they're going to war against us. So the Messiah did not come to make everybody at peace. He came for righteousness sake. And as a result of that, it's going to inevitably lead to people hating them and wanting to kill them. 
Um, but he then mentions, he says, imagine there's two kings and they're both planning on fighting war. What would be the better thing to do for the both of the kings to uh, to fight war and uh, um, and then whoever remains uh, their army uh, wins? Or if he says, or they both talk, have a dialogue, and discuss which uh, which of the two sides has the the, cor- the the better position, and whichever side, if they can come to an agreement on the better position, then they can avoid the war entirely, and both sides will change. Yes, yes. But everyone is. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying you like. Well, in the, I just read earlier today uh, in third or second John, it says, "Anyone who does not teach that Christ has come in the flesh, do not let him into your house." So I'm not saying you need to let people into your house, whoever they are. But, but if you're in a safe environment and you can have a dialogue, even with a dangerous, dangerous people group, if you're in a safe environment where that can be done, that's something I think should be pursued if possible. And I think all people are all people are rational and the people who you would say are irrational they are they're in their in their in their horrible things that they're doing they're completely irrational but they're also they have a rationality inside them somewhere that could be uh tapped into and you mentioned uh the philistines and i think that's an interesting thing to bring up because not just the philistines but there was other people groups of the torah and it, some of normally normally the torah says uh when you're capturing a nation the children animals and the resources and the virgins are not to be killed only the the men but there were seven nations which Israel was commanded to kill everything, to kill animals, to to not take any of the, the goods, but to burn it all, to kill a uh, man, woman, be it virgin or not, and child and babies. And so these people, imagine, not all of, I'm sure not all the Philistines and all these people were like bloodthirsty. Maybe some of them probably were, but I don't, I have a hard time thinking all of them were, especially the mothers and uh, young children, for example. And these people might have been having similar discussions that we might be having right now and they might have been thinking those those people that just come in and, and slaughter us without mercy and they're horrible people like so when you look at their perspective you might see that they're, they might be thinking something similar to us but I do agree with you that Christians for example and even Jews are doing the things that the Muslims are doing to the extent like the mu- Muslims uh, the terrorism that they're doing is much worse than what, than what we see in, in Christianity and Judaism there so if you look at it if you take killing a people group because of um, right but Muslims believe that it is Allah or the Creator who is telling them to do these things and um, I personally don't think that, but I know many believe that it is a different deity. So, for example, in the Gospel of John, he speaks to the Jews, and he says, you you guys don't know the Father. Uh, who's your, and he's implying that their father is Satan, the, the, the Pharisees. But we know that the Pharisees, they worship Yahweh, but he was implying that they didn't know him because they believed things about the Creator which were evil, and they were not obeying the Creator. They were their worship of him was was not sufficient. In a similar way, I believe personally, from my research, that uh, Muslims believe in a creator deity very similar to the creator deity of the Bible, with, with some differences. They attribute, they believe that this deity is saying things that our deity never said to do, and supports certain things that our deity does not support. But at the same time, their, their deity is is all powerful, all knowing, all present, all, and then there's, they have like, well, I would say, for example, so I have people who are, um, I have people who really don't like me and they like despise me. Then there are people who really love me and who think I'm a really nice guy. So if you have someone who really is a good friend of mine and really thinks I'm a really nice and loving person, and they're going to write like something about me and say, this Onia, you know, and they, and they write a little bit of a biography about me, saying who I am, what my character is like. But then you have one of my enemies do the same thing, and they're writing about me. They're painting me as a very different individual than who I am. But I see it as the same because all the diff- the only thing that's different between what they're doing and what we're doing is they're attributing certain historical actions. Uh, we have different historical actions being attributed and different character being attributed. But otherwise, everything about the two is essentially the same from what I've seen. It, the uh, 
the uncreated the uncreated one the creator the all good the all loving or the all merciful uh, all these if you look at their list of 100 names for what uh for allah it is uh very like you would think this was written by a muslim you know this is like this this is describing this seems like it's describing a hillah so i would say where if you're right, where do you draw that line between how different, like we have different beliefs about Yahuwah. All of us have different beliefs about Yahuwah. How different, uh, or let's say Elohim, or the de- the Creator, the Creator is better to say. We all have different beliefs about the Creator. Where's a line, where do we draw the line between, okay, you know what, you went too different from my view of the Creator, so now you you don't worship, you're not worshiping my deity, you're worshiping a different deity. Okay. There have been instances, uh, I'll just say this, there have been instances of um, Muslims who have decided, you know what, I'm going to fall through with this, so I'm going to I'm gonna be a suicide bomber or something. And then they have some of their friends who talk with them and they're like, don't do this, man. And then some of these people are actually, their friends are able to change their mind and convince them not to go through with it. So I think we have to be on a case-by-case basis. And I'm not saying we should, uh, everyone, you know, because, for example, um, if I see if I see someone, I'm like, okay, this person's not open minded to what I have to say because there's no point in talking with them because they're not they're not going to listen to what I have to say. It'll just be a waste of time. But if I can if I if I use my discernment and I see you know what this person really seems like he's he's open to what I have to say, then I will try for that specific person. Guys, I don't want to waste my time with people, and I think the people you're talking about, most of those people would be would be there would be no you wouldn't change them. Who's the most important man this country ever knew? Who's the man our presidents tell all their troubles to? No, it isn't Mr. Bryan, and it isn't Mr. Hughes. I'm mighty proud that I'm allowed a chance to introduce. My friends, uh, time is up now, but we are going to continue this in the next session. I've got to tell you, in the next session, things get very uh, lively. A dull course on resources turns into a melee. Join us tomorrow and you'll see what I'm talking about. From Palmyra, Virginia, this is Jackson Snyder present.